You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Where are we, Lionel? We are at Beaconsfield Services on the M40. Takes us to some glamorous places, the podcast, doesn't it? It does indeed, um, but we've had a very important mission this morning. You, Well, lots of sporting deals are done at service stations, aren't they? Certainly in football. Certainly in cycling as well, I believe. Um, you know, brown envelopes, changing hands. Well, envelopes have changed hands this morning, haven't they? Because uh, you delivered a, a whole batch of signed copies of the Grand Tour Diaries, signed by yourself and Daniel, which I will have my signature to, and uh, post off to friends of the podcast who have overpaid and are therefore eligible for a copy of the Grand Tour Diaries which will arrive in the post. All corners of the globe I've been writing out these envelopes as the people have been signing up as friends of the podcast we've got lots of listeners in America which we knew but to see the addresses to see where these books are going to is quite it's mind-blowing actually Hong Kong Singapore Australia all over Europe but about 50% going to the US. So thank you very much to all of you who have paid a bit extra to become a friend of the podcast and will receive very soon a signed copy of the book. But we didn't just meet here at random, did we, at a service station on the M40? No, we didn't. Uh, You were in the vicinity, Lionel, on a secret mission. I was. I was at Bista Village Retail Outlet, not not going Christmas shopping, um, but going to interview a man who I've long wanted to meet and interview for the podcast, but hadn't got round to. Finally managed to um, find some time in his diary. And uh, Are you going to tell us who it was at any point? I am, Richard. It was, it was Rebecca Vardy. <laughs> it wasn't Rebecca Vardy, no. It was Flavio Zappi, uh, the former Italian professional rider who was second in the King of the Mountains at the 1984 Giro d'Italia. It's one of the flattest Giro in history, wasn't it, famously? Well, well, funnily enough, that does come up. Um, I had wrongly um, thought that Zappi was a handy climber, which he obviously was, but he was much more of a sprinter, something that I didn't really appreciate fully until uh, we had our conversation this morning. Um, he also finished 12th in Milan San Remo and uh, didn't have a long career um, but uh, we talk about why his racing career ended um, a little bit prematurely and how he got back into cycling over here in the UK it won't take uh, a linguist of Daniel Freib's standing to work out that Flavio Zappi is Italian but he now lives in Oxfordshire has done for 25 years and a lot of people may well be more familiar with him because he's put his name to the Zappi um, junior and under 23 development teams and the most famous to date most famous rider to graduate from his uh, program is James Knox who went via Wiggins to the Quickstep Floors team now De Kerning Quickstep of course and who had an excellent Vuelta a España kept an audio diary for us of course during the Vuelta we talk a little bit about James Knox now Unfortunately, this morning when I uh, met up with Flavio, um, I had the most calamitous introduction, probably uh, the second most embarrassing moment of my year so far. Hey, P- Piacere, Flavio. Ciao, Piacere. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Hi. Oh, oh, oh wow. no. Did you get that? I did get that. So as you can imagine, Richard, a week before Christmas, Bista Village Retail Outlet was quite busy. There was a long queue to get into the car park. I'd arrived in good time, but was put behind and was rushing a bit. And uh, as I entered the Rafa Cafe where we had arranged to meet, um, Flavio introduced me to the man he was with, who was Paul Quarterman, the father of Charlie Quarterman, another rider who's uh, graduated from the Zappi team and is, as we speak, in Sicily with Trek Segafredo, training with Vincenzo Nibali and Mads Pedersen, the, uh, the new world champion, of course. Um, as Paul stood up to shake my hand, I knocked over a tall glass of water. The water went all over Paul's trousers. Um, a small coffee and espresso, naturally, went all over Flavio's trousers and uh, I cracked a small raffa 
espresso cup. Um, it was it was pretty embarrassing. Um, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't wearing a sort of cycling podcast T-shirt to identify myself, but perhaps the microphone gave me away. But yeah, a blundering, calamitous introduction. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, very smooth indeed, Lionel. I know you've been working on that. We should explain that the off-season, of course, I mean, you mentioned Daniel Freib. He's not with us um, because, uh, well, we're doing a few slightly different episodes. Last week we had a, a chat with Ian Boswell, Larry Warbass and Joe Dombrowski in Nice. We followed those guys through their career, so we caught up with them again. Uh, and this week again, something a bit different. And, and the off-season is an opportunity to do that. Um, and also a, a very elaborate way for you to avoid the news roundup, Lionel. <laughs> Well, yes, but the news roundup will return in the new year when we're uh, when we're you know when we're good and ready. But yeah, there has been some cycling news that we'll update people on, but that can wait until after Christmas. We're, uh, as you say, we're um, we're doing something slightly different. And well, my conversation with Flavio covers his own career, which I didn't know too much about. I knew kind of the headlines, um, but it was great to talk to him in the first half about his own career, and then in the second half talk about his uh, how he came to England and his attitude towards developing young riders. And, and ensuring that they're equipped to make a career as a professional, not just get that first contract. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much to Rafa, our headline sponsor these last three and a half years. You were in the Rafa cafe earlier today, Lionel. We're about to cross back over there, but um, we said a couple of weeks ago that um, our relationship with Rafa will end at the end of this year. So I think this is the penultimate regular episode um, title sponsored by Rafa. But again, we're incredibly grateful to Rafa for their support, which has allowed us to grow and develop the podcast and produce spin-off podcasts, the latest of which Service Course is out later this week with Tom Wally and Lizzie Banks. Listen out for that. Um, so yeah, we're very, very grateful indeed to Rafa for their, all their support. And if you want to support the podcast, you can, of course, sign up as a friend. We've just launched our new Friends program for 2020. Episode one is the stage that didn't end, and it's a look back at stage 19 of this year's Tour de France. Uh, the first part of which looks at the events surrounding the cancellation of the stage when there was uh, a hailstorm and a, a landslide. Um, and the second part is an interview with Egan Bernal, who, of course, took the yellow jersey that day and went on to win the tour, and some of the people around him. So it's a it's a podcast in two parts. Later this week, or at the start of next week, episode two for Friends of the Podcast will be a, a mashup of our live shows and our recent our recent grand tour, and then episode three will be the Giro d'Italia Diaries. Um, and if you sign up as a friend of the podcast, it's fifteen pounds for the year. If you pay a bit more and become a good friend or a best friend, you will get a signed copy of the book. And uh, if you become a friend of the podcast at the standard rate, you will also be eligible for a 20% discount on the cover price of the book. And you'll still get the book in time for Christmas if you order it now, we think. So go to thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash book to buy the book or thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe to become a friend of the podcast. As you say, Rich, we've frozen the price at £15 for the year. Just one quick technical mention for those existing friends of the podcast, just to make it very clear that this is a new system. It's not doesn't run with the same uh, password or anything as your old friends of the podcast system. So you don't need the old po- podcast password or anything like that. All you need to sign up is uh, your email address and a credit or debit card. And it's as easy as one, two, three. But let's go over to the Rafa Cafe at the Bista Village retail outlet for my conversation with Flavio Zappi. <laughs> Well, happy Christmas, Flavio. Nice to finally meet you. I must apologise about my clumsy uh, entrance there. I spilled water all over um, the table. Um, it's been a long season. That's all I can say. That's all I can say in, uh, by way of an apology. But uh, great to finally get you on the podcast. And um, just first of all, introduce who else is with us here today, please. Yeah, Paul um, Quarterman is um, a very good friend of mine and has been involved in... Uh, in um, developing the club, um, Zappi Cycling Club, at the beginning, now the racing team and the junior team specifically, with me uh, for the last seven years, and um, and um, yeah, I I think it's a it's a good um, uh, giving back to him as well, not just uh, in always in the in the behind my aura kind of thing. So that's why I, I wanted him to be around with us today. 
Well, nice to meet you. Of course, your son is, um, he's off, he joined up with the Trek Segafredo team very recently. Yes, yeah, Charlie, uh, well, first of all, started out with Zappi several years ago as a youth through the junior ranks, raced last year as an under-23 with Flavio in Italy, including the Giro, baby Giro. And now, you know, it's been a really good uh, good year and he's riding with uh, Trek Segafredo now. So, your adventure. How did he get on in the Giro, tell us? Um, he had two uh, two really quite quite good results. He got a uh, fourth place in the in the prologue and was only I think 1.6 seconds off the off winning position. So that was a really good result for him and he got to wear a jersey which was great. And then I think stage 7 or 8 um, there was a breakaway down the road with about 20k to go. He bridged across to it and um, from that managed to uh, eke out third place which was probably a, a quite a spectacular result really and caught the eye of the the world tour teams and, and agents and that's where the success really came from and he's currently training with the team before christmas and then coming home for christmas and then going off for another block of training before the race starts the racing yeah. starts yeah that's right so he's out in sicily right now training with the most of the the trek segafredo team including the women's team actually they're all training together down there um there's a group out in australia now preparing for the tour down under including richie port but the rest are in Sicily, they come back Christmas, New Year, and then they're out to Mallorca for another block of training, followed by races. Well, Flavio, um, your team is you know, developing riders and a couple of high-profile names now. We'll talk about James Knox uh, a little bit later on, but he came through your system on his way to the World Tour. But I wanted to start by asking you about your cycling career and, and first of all I guess you're, you're obviously not um, you're not from Oxfordshire you're from Italy originally Where, whereabouts are you from in Italy? Uh, well I'm I was I grew up in, in near Varese so just below the mountains um, uh, north Milan uh, although my family originally is from uh, Romagna so near Pantani specifically so the blood is there from that area um, I grew up there, uh, cycling wise as I said in, in Varese area that's where I started my career I got pro uh, eventually after six seven years of um, um, all, the, all the youth and junior level and under 23 uh, picked a few results nothing spectacular um, I did um, only four or five years uh, and just before the um, um, before the, the very famous in, or infamous uh, use it, using of the stuff which I, I, I spotted at the time, uh, I managed to get out of the system. And I stayed away from cycling for uh, 15 years, almost uh, sick of, of the whole um, system. Um, but then eventually he came back to me and, uh, and I felt like I need to give back. Um, to some of those boys um, and uh, been living in England my wife is English and I, I settled here 25 years ago uh, I kind of feel like um, I can give um, opportunities and uh, knowledge I got to those boys well, we'll come on to that a little bit, but uh, Varese, in the, certainly in the 90s, was kind of the, the home base for so many pro riders, wasn't it? Um, was it the same in the, the sort of late 70s, early 80s, when you were making your way into the pro ranks? Oh, definitely. And when, I, when I was a junior, there was, um, there was a place where we used to go out and meet uh, for a training on a, on a big training day, Wednesday or Thursday. And that was Gallarate near Malpensa Airport. And that's where all the pro used to be there. So for us... All the boys were so excited to be there at nine o'clock and, and see Giuseppe Saroni, Panizza, um, all, the, all the, the big names in the area and train with them. And, you know, and that was 200 kilometers and that was no food in the, in the pocket. And there was one bottle cage and 53, 15. <laughs> I'm going I'm to interject at this point because I remember Flavio telling me he grew up in a, in a hotel, family run hotel with his family uh, just outside of Varese. And uh, I remember Flavio telling me that the Colombian Nationals team stayed in the hotel uh, one time and Flavio was down in the basement, grabbed one of their bikes and went off for a ride and that was part of his discovery of cycling. So <laughs> what, cycling wasn't in your family, you know, with your, your, your father or your parents or your grandfather or anything like this? It was something that you discovered on your own? No, that was um, totally my older brother's passion. My older brother's passion uh, for cycling was um, unbelievable. He, he was a chef in, the, in our restaurant and, he, and as a, when he was like 16, 16, working in the kitchen, he managed to, to ask my dad, could he go and buy some 
fish somewhere and then uh, while he was traveling on his bike um, in, in near near Galarate there was a big bike race going through and he just followed them just to give you that and then he, he stayed away for like six hours <laughs> came back got got a big <laughs> a little kick in his bottom and um, but that was his passion and when uh, as Paul was saying the Colombian team came into our hotel in 1974 uh, uh, during the world championship in Varese the, well, the road championship was uh, was in in um, Switzerland, but the track was in Varese because there was a track. Colombian t- team won the pursuit with uh, coaches Rodriguez. So th- in the in the morning they were training on the road. In the afternoon it goes on the track. So m- my brother came to say, "Hey, there are some <laughs> lovely bicycles downstairs in the garage." So we went off and ride, and uh, I, I I I remember the sensation of the speed. And I thought, uh, I quite like this. And I started. That was when I started. So how, how did you make the transition from just being interested in cycling and, and doing it as a pastime to realising that you were quite good at it and could start racing? It, it was literally immediate. Um, there was definitely some some power there, I guess. Um, and um, and uh, straight away from the first few races, the, uh, I started picking up results as a, as a youth. And, um, and of course, uh, the, the passion of the small clubs in the, in the area, um, with a lot of old people really into cycling, they, 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 they feel, they feel um, the, the, the passion to me. And it um, and, and, and went from then onwards, literally. And were you quite quickly better than your brother? No, my brother never had to race or train. He was... First of all, he's 15 years older than me, and um, for him, was just following me. So he was there with this um, 70s cam uh, video. I got incredible footage uh, still in the loft, and he was doing my massage eventually. He was looking after my diet. He was, um, he was pretty much my coach. So he was a fan, really. He he'd be watching the Giro on TV and the classics on TV. TV. That was that was what kind of drew you in. Yes, yes, he's um, he was that basically. And when you turned professional, I mean, just just describe what the Italian scene was like then, because there were so many professional cycling teams in Italy at that time, weren't there? It was a really, it was a really thriving world, but it was also quite a closed world in that there was such a domestic scene of racing. I, I guess um, you, you probably didn't need to leave Italy to have a full race program all year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, I remember the, the the major nation was Italy, France, Belgium, a bit of Dutch, and a bit of Americans. There was hardly anybody else in uh, other than those nations, and therefore Italy was a, a, a big um, uh, calendar. Uh, we also did the Tour of Switzerland, the Belgium Classics, some some Belgium races, uh, French races, but nothing much more than that. Obviously, there was also Spanish rider as well. Um, it was. Um, it, it feels like it, in a way it was kind of easier to get into the pro scene but there was also a lot of um, riders in Italy uh, at the time I mean I remember back in my days uh, as a junior there was easy uh, in my area 10 races with um, 200 people there so making it, was, making it wasn't that easy and I guess the teams were quite small as well, maybe sort of 12 or 13, 14 riders, so not quite the same size of organisations as we have today. Correct, 12 riders, no more. That was the maximum. So you turned pro in what, 1981? Correct, yeah, 1981, after two years and the 23. And what was your first team like? Was it as glamorous as it looked on the TV? You no, know, it was um, one of the medium level, not, you know, the top level at the time was Del Tongo, was... Um, Bianchi Piaggio with Tommy Prim and Contini, all these people. So we were like, and also we were also a little bit underdog because there were nine out of 12 were new pros. So, um, you know, we were definitely the one that I have to shut up <laughs> and just get on with the jobs. And uh, it, we, it was tough the first few months racing and when we did uh, in Sicily, in Puglia. Tirreno Adriatico, incredible tough uh, entry into Milan Sanremo, and then from then on, everything got much better. We almost got through that period, uh, and then and that's where we start really performing. Was Trentino Giro Italia? In fact, we did beautiful result at the Giro as a as a new pro. We won the team time trial against Francesco's Moser team. 
So what was the style of racing like in the early 80s in Italy? Because from when I was growing up reading about cycling, the cliche was that Italian racing was very, very piano for maybe three hours and then absolutely insane for two hours. Is, is that how it was? I did struggle uh, getting, uh, getting uh, into that style. Um, as, a, as an amateur, it's like now, it's full on from the gun. And I enjoy that kind of, kind of racing. And looking backwards, it probably suited me better to go to race in Belgium because in Belgium it was similar anyway. Um, no, in Italy was, as you said, uh, very slow to start, very slow, and, and, you know, for hours. But the last hour was just awful. You know, in that, that switch in pace for me, I, I, I did struggle. Why was it? Culturally, was it something about the Italian nature, or is it just the cliche that the TV coverage starts with an hour to go, and that was what sparked everyone into life? Well, that's that definitely got... Um, kind of um, a reason uh, definitely the, during this stage of the Giro Italia was like that uh, the helicopter is arriving that's it we're all going full <laughs> gas and um, but in Belgium wasn't in Belgium was full on all the time and I enjoy racing in there and also Milan San Remo for instance although it was in Italia it made me because there was 300 riders 300 kilometers and all the foreigners are there so the, the racing was um, different and I enjoyed that kind of racing because of it so you had two or three years just kind of getting to grips with what it meant to be a pro in Italy. And then in 1984, you find yourself in a team with, uh, um, with Johan van der Velde and Luciana van Imp, yes. um, who, of course, you know, one, of the, one of the best riders that Belgium has ever produced. Um, van Imp certainly was coming towards the end of his career by this stage. What, how did those two riders, um, a Dutchman and a Belgian, end up in your medium-sized Italian team at that time? I really don't know. Actually, I'm, I have to be honest. I came back. I came to race to um, uh, Metaro Mobili Pinarello. That's the team uh, on the back of a quite uh, difficult year. I almost gave up. I had a bad injury, and I, I went to surgery. And then I came back, and I, I lost a little bit of track of the racing season for a uh, scene for a year or two. So, uh, Metaro Mirarel, Pinello started the year before, and they obviously had some money. So they obviously, you know, like like anything, they start um, is is about uh, investing in um, and have the money to, to pay those salaries. Van der Velde, to me, is is still it was an incredible rider, fantastic on descending, fantastic sprint, climbing. He had everything. Um, Van Imper, of course, the class of a, a Grimper. Moody Grimper, <laughs> but uh, very good a climber, and um, and we learn a lot. But don't forget, in that team we have Vittorio Algeri, now director sportivo Michelin. We had Riccardo Magrini, now uh, great um, speaker at uh, Eurosport Italy in Italy, and um, we had um, Luciano Borgognoni. And th- th- we had um, a very interesting uh, sorry Luciano Borgognoni the year before, but we had a very good solid uh, all the guys there to, to give that depth because of course van der Velde I think was fifth in that Giro in 84 and uh, van Impe was seventh I think in in the same Giro so you were obviously you in the team you had riders who were right up there in the overall for, for listeners who don't aren't familiar perhaps with the names of riders from the 70s and 80s uh, van Impe was uh, king of the mountains in the Tour de France of course van der Velde yeah exactly van der Velde um, had a Two really good Giro, uh, Giro d'Italia in 87 and 88, I think, uh, might have won the King of the Mountains um, in one of those years, certainly on the podium at, at some point. Um, as you say, Flavio, a, a, a you know, really ace climber at that time. Um, but you weren't so bad going up hills yourself, were you? That 1984 Giro, you were second in the King of the Mountains competition. I mean, what are your memories thinking back to the 84 Giro and, 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 and coming so close to winning one of the jerseys? You, you held it, I think, for a couple of weeks. Well, I, I go back a little bit on Van der Velde. Van der Velde, don't forget, he got third at the Tour de France, helping Zotemer to win it. And on the back of that, he won the national champ road, so was an amazing rider. Uh, so for him coming to Italy, everything was definitely, uh, you know, easy in a way. Uh, on the back of those results, and for me, it was a, almost an, an unexpected result because I, my job for that year in that Giro Italia was to go for breakaways. Um, yes, you're right. We had amazing results as a team. In fact, we won the team classification, and so my job was to go in, the t- in a breakaway and pick up some money. 
so spring competitions, all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I do remember exactly when I got the jersey because I went to this breakaway in, in down the south of Italy. It was horribly hot, it was probably 40 degrees. I never liked the hot weather, despite being Italian. I really hated it, but I was there and I struggled to give my turns and luckily there was this thunderstorm arrived <laughs> and I don't know what happened to me, but I literally switched to my level and there was three climbs on that on that stage and I won them and then the next day there was a, another climb and I, I was supposed to lead the sprint on the top of the climb for Lucien Manimpe, which was the, the guy that was supposed to get the jersey and as was <laughs> leading out the sprint I, I went a bit too hard and I won it <laughs> it got really cross with me <laughs> I'm not sure if, and, I, and then I got more points and then I ended up saying well I'll just carry on trying to keep it and I kept it but to be honest you know that Giro was probably the flattest Giro ever in history so it was a you know still still uh, still okay I guess and then when eventually Laurent Fignon decided uh, decided to make um, hold on a second Okay, when I eventually decide to, sorry, that was my phone, when I um, decide to put the hammer down and, and do what he need to do, which it was to, to win the Giro, on his way, just pick up uh, four mountains. You say that was a flat Giro. I mean, it's, it's all relative. I mean, Italy is a surprisingly um, hilly country, especially down in the south, hills that you wouldn't necessarily know about when, even from looking at the road book, I guess. I mean, it's almost like a country of two halves in, in a lot of senses. Um, but, of course, that was the year Francesco Moser won the Giro, and I suppose the suspicion was that the course had been designed um, to give Moser a great time trialist, but not, not super in the very high mountains, the best possible chance. Is that how you saw it at the time? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was um, the, the, everybody was waiting for the second part of the Giro, which didn't happen because there was uh, they have to change the course for whatever reason. Well, what what actually happened? I mean, the story is that the stage to Val Gardena, which would have gone over some big mountains, um, the climbs were were, well, were cancelled, um, but then subsequently the the roads were passable. There was no snow on the roads, as as people have been led to believe, and Fignon's great chance to overtake Moser was gone. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I'm guessing that's the reason. I mean, I wasn't really for me it was was okay <laughs> to avoid it. <laughs> probably 90% of the peloton at the time so that was good um, I, it sounds like that way now you know looking back you, you, I can see so many strange little things happening in that Giro and in other situations such as? <laughs> I don't know I, I, it's, it's, some of them are maybe I, I got to watch it I'm not sure if, so I, I might talk to you another time about <laughs> it <laughs> well, we'll come, we can, yeah. but by saying that, do you mean um, you, you, there was a very much a hometown feel to the Giro in those days? But having an Italian winner was important to the race organisers. I guess, I guess it was very important. And um, and it, don't forget, Francesco in that period was was the the sheriff. He was the he was an incredibly powerful, to say the least. Uh, do you mean on the bike, but off the bike as well? Yeah, yeah, with his teammates. I was I was sorry for these teammates. One of them was a very good friend of mine, and I really I really didn't like the way he, he was treated. Um, too severe, too too um, too much the boss. I guess I guess uh, there's a lot of that. And so for, for yeah for the for the for the media for the for the for the sponsors for the organizer it, it was good to have Francesco. They just fresh one. Um, Milan Sanremo and the rec our record on this very unusual uh, new training regime, um, which I was unheard to win the Milan Sanremo without doing any stage race before, like Tirreno Adriatico or or um, Perinis. So then um, it was something new that happened. We later on later on find out why. Well, I think we kind of knew at the time because the doctors who were part of Moser's. Um 
preparation team were they were working out in the open weren't they they were there in the velodrome when he did the hour record it wasn't like it was a secret but i guess people didn't know at the time exactly what the methods were that were going into um you know some some of the performances it was legal at the time because then nobody knows what, what was it so if if it's a brand new system a brand new situation and it's not on, the, on any legal requirement then you can do it and they did it you know they had the money the 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 risk, I think, they take a lot of risk, and um, and they got it. They got the results. But uh, at the time, you know, Moser, he was the, he was the boss. It was Moser and Saroni, wasn't it? The two were the were the big names, and there was the, this big rivalry. I mean, was was there a sense of excitement at being in amongst and, and racing in in events where, you know, the the two biggest stars in um, in the sport and two of the biggest stars in Italian sport full stop were uh, were competing. Not really, <laughs> not really, because um, you had a uh, with them or you you out. Um, there's very difficult, very almost impossible opportunity to you to get results if you are not part of the system, whether you are in their team or, or whatever. I mean, I had three amazing results uh, in the pre-selection races for the uh, national team selection. As a new pro, I got a fifth, a seventh, and a top 15, which um, at the time, um, or uh, nowadays, I will be straight into the national team. But I couldn't, because Moser and Saroni wanted a seven rider for their own mates. I guess you can see the logic in that. They'd want people who rode for them all year round to support them in the World Championships. But I guess these are the sort of romantic stories or the stories that we as non-Italians romanticise about Italian cycling. You know, these, the, 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 the splits between the stars and the, and the deals that are done and all of that kind of thing. But from what you're saying, you know, when you're in, inside that, that world, it's perhaps not as, not as glamorous, not as exciting um, as, it, as it perhaps appears when the, when the stories take on this kind of mythical um, aspect that we tend to give them. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, for a young rider, it's, it's almost impossible to make it unless you are selling yourself to, a, to that situation. And, um, and um, you know, it's, it's, it is quite hard because you're a young rider, you're coming through, you've done incredibly well as, a, as, a, as an amateur. You're on the top 10, 5 in, 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 in Italy, in the world, and then all of a sudden you are no one on the other side. So mentally, it, it makes a massive effect. And uh, to me, definitely made it. I, I definitely cracked mentally at uh, the time. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton. Cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's Seb Piquet, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, interrupting my interview with Flavio Zappi to remind me to tell you that this week's episode is sponsored by Pro Cycling Magazine, the leading magazine covering professional cycling. And all of the Cycling Podcast listeners can get a subscription today and get three issues of Pro Cycling Magazine for a pound with the special code TCP19. I'll give you the website address at the end of this uh, this segment um, so that you can uh, sign up for Pro Cycling Magazine. Plus, you'll also receive the Heroes of Pro Cycling ebook, which which uh, ordinarily costs £10. Now, um, Richard, all three of us have written for Pro Cycling over the years. Daniel, of course, probably most closely associated with the magazine. Uh, It's been going for 20 years, and he's written for Pro Cycling almost since the start, whereas you and I have been occasional contributors over the years, haven't we? He started when he was eight, writing for Pro Cycling, I think. (laughs) No, (laughs) straight out of university. Um, And, uh, yeah, Daniel was... um, has been very involved in in the the sort of evolution of pro cycling magazine over the years yeah and uh, well it's edited by edward pickering a, a long time colleague of mine of course and well i look forward to the magazine plopping onto the doormat each month um because it's always a good read and it's a, a magazine that really feels luxurious to flick through and just a quick mention for the cover a couple of months ago um which i know ed was very proud of because it's a a, a kind of pastiche of the who's album cover the kids are all right featuring egan bernal in the pete townsend role at the front uh tade pogachar pavel sivakov and remco evenepoel really kind of 
inventive, imaginative cover that was, and that reflects the context. Do you think any, do you think any of them will have heard of the Who, <laughs> or be or, or been familiar with the cover? I think they were all asked, and I think it was a, a, a naught for four on that front. Yeah. <laughs> but they're too young aren't they you know they're too young but i think that gives the kind of uh uh the, the style of the covers really gives uh the strongest hint of the quality of the content inside i think um and and even you write for it richard on occasion so you did a piece about oh. egg and Bernal's, uh tour de france victory in, in the most recent edition yeah and uh, that that issue that you mentioned lionel with the focus on the four the four um prodigious young talents um just one little anecdote, because it's it's you do get great detail in some of the features in pro cycling. It was a pro cycling feature in Willie Smith actually that inspired a kilometre zero at the Vuelta. Um, but there's a, a piece on Tadej Pogacar in there, and a story um, concerning uh, the the Slovenian national coach Andre Hauptmann, who went to watch a, a race ten years ago, a kids race when he was working for the the government. Um, and he says, I turned up a bit late for the race and the first thing I saw was a big group of teenage riders leading and a small guy, much younger, lagging 100 metres behind trying to catch up. I said to the organisers, we've got to do something to pace this little guy up to the front again. And they said, no, it's not what you think. He's in front. He's lapped the whole field. <laughs> and that little guy was uh, Tadaj Pogacar and he was a couple of years younger. He was 10 at the time and a couple of years younger than all the other riders. And there he was. Uh, lapping the field so that was a nice little story about his his development just shows you don't necessarily have to be a genius to spot talent sometimes uh, anyway if you would like to subscribe to pro cycling magazine and get inside the world's toughest sport then go to my favorite magazines.co.uk slash tcp19 and use the code tcp19 to get your discount which means you subscribe to the magazine and you get the first three issues for only a pound or call 0344 848 if you're in the uk um, that's my favorite magazines.co.uk slash tcp19 and the code tcp19 just on the 84 Giro, I mean, what was the experience of going to the podium every day, pulling on the, I think, green jersey as King of the Mountains at the time, day after day? I mean, were you building a sort of media profile, getting stories in uh, La Gazzetta dello Sport, or were you still kind of one of the one of the smaller names? No, I knew I knew it was a, it was a bit of a fake uh, <laughs> glory. You know, everybody knew I, I, I'm a sprinter, I'm not a climber. Uh, I just took my chances. I, I was clever enough to get in the breakaways again with my jersey I had a very good form I mean I never remember to feeling so good every single day and uh, every day was almost the jerseys give you extra power plus you know I used to do my gruppetto therefore the next race I knew when I wanted to go I had the power to because I'm a sprinter I had the power to get a breakaway when I wanted so everything went perfectly for me and um, and it was nice to go on, on the to get the uh, the flowers and, and the fame, but I knew underneath it was just... Uh, yeah. But what was it like, I mean, try to compare to the sort of modern day, because in my head I have a, a, a vision of, of the teams being a little bit like Gianni Savio's team now, you know, having to, having to go out in front, having to, um, you know, take risks in the race, having to make the race, really, um, and, and the riders themselves seeing it as a stepping stone on to maybe the next level. We were slightly above that we will definitely have the, the names to to get the results like as i said in impe van der velde and um but still we're still pretty much on in awe or afraid of some of those big teams obviously they were there all day working and getting the result i mean f give you an example the, uh, one of the things when i look at the other races nowadays they do lead our train of 3k to go lead our train back in the day of 25k to go i mean Del Tongo was riding in the front for Saroni for at least 25k at the stages. And, uh, you know, those, when you see people doing that kind of stuff, you feel, wow, <laughs> you know. So from your own career as well, I mean, the, the, probably the other standout result would be, uh, I think, 12th place in Milan San Remo um, one year. Do you remember much about that? Or are, th are there any other standout days that, that still stick in the memory 30 plus years later? Well, those, that one in the Paris Roubaix was the, my, the one that stuck forever, including when I won the, at the Trentino. The Milan Saremo was a, a, a horrible day, wet all day, wet, wet, wet and cold. And I remember, um, again, it was 300 k 300 
riders, a lot of fighting on the Turquino, and uh, crashes all over the place coming down the Turquino. And then uh, soon we get into the into the seaside. Anderson goes away, and the whole Renault chasing uh, single file for hours. I mean, seven and a half hours racing. And then uh, I, I, I was hanging, hanging, hanging. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. The last um, hour, hour and a half, when we get to uh, before the before the final one, what's it called? So there's the Cipressa, Cipressa. and then the, yeah. then the Poggio, of course, the last one. Yeah, Cipressa, all of a sudden, I, I find my legs. I was um, still suffering the same way, but people were getting dropped. Then I thought, hmm, that's, uh, that's interesting. And all of a sudden, I find myself in the top 20. Coming down over the Poggio, I, on top of the Poggio, I was fifth on the top when uh, Moser attacked on the, on the descent. Kinetti uh, nicely gave him a little, a little space and um, got around the corner. And then, uh, of course, when you get down the Poggio um, uh, on the last two kilometers, Moser disappeared. <laughs> we later find out on YouTube. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, have a look. <laughs> I will have a look. Will I have to fill this in for the listeners, or are you going to tell us what happened? I, I think it's interesting for you guys to have a look what happened in the last three kilometres on the 1984 Milan Saremo. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll see if we pick up pick up that. But listeners, there you go. You've got to go to YouTube and, uh, and look for the 1984 Milan Saremo. Moser uh, attacca. Chinetti forse nella scia di Moser eccezionale Chinetti oltre bravo Moser naturalmente ma in queste condizioni um, just uh, before we wrap up on your career tell me a bit about Paris-Roubaix as well because uh, well I mean just to just to ride on the cobbles in, in the race itself is uh, is an experience that um, well lives with riders and, and the rest of their lives is it the same for you? well I I went to Belgium as a first experience in my life a um, couple of years early when I did the Roubaix already and I did uh, the last 90 kilometer in the bus sleeping with another hundred riders because that's what happened there's a big bus picking up all the riders on the way and but that, that year I went uh, two weeks early with uh, with the team we did a training camp in um, in one of this hotel on the motorway we raced La Pan we raced Bevergem we raced Flandre and I never I literally rode on the cobbles previously properly and um, and I knew the importance of uh, getting to the Arenberg in the first part of the, of the peloton I, and I sprinted I literally used my sprinting abilities and I got the top five entering the the, the, the Arenberg when I get out I, I was away with a minute break but that's just riding it but I I, I, I develop a good quality in, in the previous races and I uh, from then, I had uh, several crashes because it was a wet day again. Um, hanging on uh, on the group uh, with uh, Sean Kelly driving it. Dropped the wheel for like 10 meters. The thing, Kelly's car, got through and made me crash. Although I, I was all over anyway. I was done anyway. But that didn't help. And then eventually managed to finish it with uh, Stephen Roach, who did 90% of the job to take me to the velodrome. And I feel really bad, but Stephen, sorry, but uh, I sprinted. <laughs> <laughs> so you let Stephen Roach tow you all the way to the velodrome and then you pipped him on the line. I kind of did, but I, but I, I, did, I did help him a little bit. I, I, I mean, he, he, he was so good anyway. I don't think for him it was very important to get 18. I was the first of Italian that year. I, I even got a special interview on, on Rai Sport. And um, yeah, I, I was naughty that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's done it. I mean, it's it's fair game, really. You know, you, you pay the consequences one one day later on. I guess um, that's how cycling works, isn't it? Um, I mean, from listening to you talk, listen to you talking about um, uh, you know your career and 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 how things were going and and the passion you have for it now. Looking back, it's kind of puzzling why it didn't continue on for longer. I mean, tell me about the circumstances that led to you, um, you know, basically deciding that professional cycling wasn't for you. I, I lost um, the contract after the 1984 Giro and um, good result. I had an amazing uh, contract for the year after, 1985, with Morella Rossin. Uh, but they, um, that's where they started the new coach um, program with uh, Aldo Sassi at the time, which uh, then funded the Mapei Sport, 
very famous and he led what is now considered the coaching standard at the time there was no coaching he was the first one to start and he, he did um, do this training specific for us and out of 12 rather 10 lost the contract the next season so I went from uh, uh, be out there at the Poggio to not even finishing uh, races and they we we reckon a lot of was to do with the with the with the training it was very it was totally different to what we used to and um, and then Aldo Sassi uh, rest in peace um, Aldo uh, is um, he also said that he, they gradually change the system to make a little bit more effective for cycling at the time it was more like athletic. When you say change, what made the training harder or more specific, or what? What, what were the differences? We do a lot of power lifting, lifting, but um, not much uh, agility. Therefore, we are very fit lifters. Um, but not nothing to do with cycling, so we have no uh, spinning legs. And then later, the developer to turn that kind of training, for example, there was other training to more. Um, into cycling so you can transfer that the kind of power you, you're building into more emotion and now it's, it's a basic standard uh, procedure they do uh, nowadays and um, so he was ahead of his time but some right you probably weren't ready for it at that time or the change was too too dramatic at the time I think it was a combination of that it's a radical change it was also um, um, the wrong training for cycling at the time which in then then gradually developed uh, more specific and it, and it did work, but, you know, as I said, 10 out of 12 riders were out. And I lost um, contract for next season. I lost interest. I was a bit... There was a lot of factors, you know, including what we mentioned earlier. And so on. I, I decided I wanted to, to, to break through, break away from, from, from this kind of life. Well, we'll take a break there, Flavio. I'm going to look at the 1984 Milan San Remo on YouTube. Um, maybe we'll get another coffee and uh, we'll resume um, in a few minutes. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And you can still get 25% off all your Science in Sport products be a good Christmas present wouldn't it Science and Sport goodies at 25% off even better um, you can get 25% more at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25 you're looking confused Lionel yeah do you get 25% more with a 25% discount uh, the mathematicians out there will tell 25% us 25% more in terms of value yes at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25 now back to your very interesting interview with Flavio Zappi I've had a look at YouTube, the 1984 uh, Milan San Remo. I didn't realise it was motor paced in those days, Flavio. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite a few motorbikes on the on the uh, just as they come off the descent there. I mean, would people complain these days, and rightly so, about how close the vehicles get to the riders, not just for influencing the race, but also the safety of the riders. But I mean, coming down the the Via Roma there in 1984, it looks like a different sport. There's probably seven or eight motorbikes all circled around Moser and uh, quite a few cars in the finish straight as well. It, it really was a, a different looking sport in those days. To be honest, um, when people were talking about the time, I, I didn't actually make any t- notice of it. I thought it was just people talking. Uh, it's only recently when I looked more specifically on, on those, those channels, those YouTube channels, and looking at the video, thinking, wow, and now knowing how the difference they can make uh, with the aerodynamics, the, the we, you know, th- th- there was definitely something going on there, and um, I mean, there's no doubt that Francesco was amazing to be out there in that situation. But you know, that's what happened. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, and it, and it's not the not the only incident in big big races. I mean, uh, if you if you spend a lot of time surfing through YouTube, looking at races from the 80s and even the 90s, you know, the the number of vehicles that are there influencing the results, I guess, or influencing in in a in a way, maybe not changing the results dramatically, perhaps, but who, we can't know, can we? Um, but that was Italian cycling, and that was cycling um, in the, in those days, and. Uh, 
Well, Flavio, you told me about how the end of your career came. Um, but what I don't know is what brought you to England in the first place and why specifically Oxfordshire? Well, I'm married with a British lady. We settled in, um, in Abingdon, near Oxford, uh, in 2000, 1997. And at the time, I uh, was not interested at all in cycling still. Uh, Did you meet in Italy or meet over here? What, what, what kind of brought you over? What, what do you want to know my love story? Well, well I mean, <laughs> not, not in any, not in any uh, intimate detail, but I mean, you know, yeah, what, what kind of got you over to England in the first place? Yes, I mean, uh, we met in Sicily. It was, um, it was a love story of, of, the, of the 80s. And, um, and then um, we spent a bit of time in Italy and then uh, we, we decided to go to live in England. And um, back in those days, I was more interested in football. Uh, both of my boys made into Oxford United Academy and uh, I used my uh, training skills uh, and lifestyle to them and for different reasons. One went into music, the other one had an injury and finished like that. And then later on, uh, uh, my dad passed away when I came back to Italy for, uh, for uh, his, his um, funeral I met. Uh, few people I knew from cycling time and uh, one of them particularly Andrea Curato was really fit and, uh, and uh, by then I was pretty much uh, over, overweight and smoking regularly and I thought well I need to do something about it I uh, picked up a bike on the skip in Oxford cleaned up it was a falcon I liked it because it was it reminded me back in my days, I put my Oxford United top on and I went up riding with the Oxford University boys and, and, I, and, I, and that's where everything started again. My passion came back. I remember to call my son halfway. Actually, I, I, initially it was literally just to go up and down, I've been on talks, commuting, just to lose a bit of weight. And then I didn't like people overtake me or drop me so I said okay on the way back I, I made a, a bigger loop I went down to Whitney and back and uh, and then uh, I called my son one day I said that, oh I, I feel the same sensation when I used to train I like it and uh, so I started training more and more started racing I called BCF I said um, am I too old to race and I said no Marco Melliot is still racing I said okay so I raced I went straight to cut one in three months or something like that and um, and then um, I start learning about power meters and aerodynamics, all that kind of things, and watts. And I so I wanted to learn everything. And one day in one of in one of my rides here uh, with a Zappi club, because I set up a, a club as well. And uh, one of the university friends of mine uh, uh, said, um, "Flavio is not." And I, I was showing off a little bit about my power on this climb for some reason. Like you do when you have these gadgets, isn't it? <laughs> like it makes any difference, really. But anyway, I was saying that to him, and he said, "The Flavio, it's not about you anymore. Look at those boys in the back of this group. And it made me think. So I started to um, put more attention to those boys. One of them was Charlie Quarterman. And, um, and it started from there. My, I want now, I really, it's my, it's my life. I can't let you mention football without asking, who is, who is your team back in Italy? Used to be AC Milan, is not anymore. Um, your boys playing football. Did you did you go to watch them play? Uh, you know, go and watch the first team play at, at Oxford. Oh yeah, I was really. I was thinking at one point I was putting together a, a, a team myself. I've been a manager myself. I really loved it. I was there training three, four times a week, where the Oxford United guys they were only training once a week. I said that's not possible. I mean, we were coming from Italy training. Um, playing for, uh, for uh, big teams in Italy, the, the, the standard of a training was completely different there. And I thought, no, no, I want to I wanna do the Italian way. And um, I was incredibly involved in that. And, but then getting back into cycling and realising that you still felt the same sensations that you had when you were uh, you know, a pro rider. Um, at what point, I'm just curious, when you're riding with these university students, at, at, at what point did you volunteer the information that you'd ridden the Giro d'Italia and Paris-Roubaix and milan San Remo, or did you keep that on the, on the down low initially? No, I didn't say anything. They, they discovered themselves and, um, and then they, they said, oh, but now I know why. <laughs> and I used to ride, I remember, this Falcon bike with um, not even clip-on pedals, just literally my gym shoes and... Um, 
and my, and my football top on and just a pair of jeans. And those guys, they were all there with the, with the proper gears, and, and that was funny. <laughs> and then you were you were racing and, and enjoying the, the thrill of racing, but but also, as you said, you know, taking taking an interest in the development of young British riders. I mean, this would have been, I guess, around a time when cycling was beginning to boom in the UK. Yes, yes, and um, the first the first thing I did uh, was to set up a team where I used to race on, but also have uh, riders to race with me. And my idea was to coach on the peloton, so even even further from from the car. And to be honest, in England, this is the only way you can do it because there's not <laughs> there's no way you can uh, be in a, in a convoy. There's no convoy. And so you were like the player manager, really. Yeah, yeah. So I had um, very good riders with me. Um, you probably heard about Will Fox and Dexter Guardias. Um, uh, that's what uh, one of them was. Um, um, Oh God! And now he's an incredible triathlete. Uh, damn, I don't remember his name now. I can't believe that. Anyway, we we had some interesting um, experience in uh, in Belgium with them, and then gradually uh, I got more riders, and then eventually I uh, used not racing anymore, but training with them. Then I had a bad accident in Portugal when I almost lost my life, cracking my neck, and I and then decided eventually to stay in the car only. And uh, every year, just more and more riders, basically, and gradually better. Tell me about the accident, because I didn't know about that. You, you, it was on your bike? Yeah, it was on the bike, and just a little Saturday ride before the race, and I just lost my bar, I went down my neck, my head, and I concertina my back, and I broke my C2, which is normally called the hangman fracture. And, um, oh, I just remember the name, Joe Skipper. Joe Skipper was one of my boys. He's now one of the top triathletes in the, in the world. I think he won top 10 at Kona and all that kind of stuff. Incredible. Um, yeah, I cracked my neck. I, um, luckily, my wife made an insurance for me to be repatriated in the UK, got repatriated because in Portugal I didn't know what to do. For I think the, uh, the riders saved your life that day, though, didn't they? The guys that you're out training with. Noxie was there, I remember, for sure. Uh, it was Dan Pearson that t- told me at the time, said, don't move, don't move your neck, don't move your head at all. And I think that was determined. And, and the paramedics arrived as well, really looking look after me really well at the time. But still, they didn't know what, to, what the next story was. So luckily, I was, flew back to UK and, and yeah, I, was, um, I went to surgery the next day and um, they fixed my neck. Yeah. And... Tell me about the, 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 the idea of the team, because obviously initially it was, was it just local riders from sort of Oxfordshire and, and then you started looking further afield and then you developed a reputation for um, being an organisation that could give people an experience racing overseas and I guess that went step by step? Yes, it went gradually more and more. So we started with um, the first team uh, just riding together in UK, some races in Belgium, some Kermesses, come back. The next year, it was a little bit more, do maybe a couple of weeks in Portugal training and then another couple of weeks racing in Italy. And 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 then the year after, so well, actually, we spent a little bit more time in Italy and, and now we literally are all the time away. And um, the purpose is that um, create a, a more general feel of what is European calendar is more opportunity, higher level, higher standard safety, because one of the things which I didn't like much about racing in the UK was the open roads. Um, still don't like it. And, um, but it, it was difficult. It still is, um, mainly because I can't get any sponsorship, main sponsorship. I mean, Paul has been probably my biggest sponsor throughout this period. Um, reasons from UK potential sponsor, well, you're never here. If I'm in Italy, well, you're British. And so on. But my purpose was to give them the opportunity to race in Italy, in Spain, in, in Belgium, in France, to give the proper um, European level standard. If I can just put, bring Paul in here, you, you, Flavio mentioned your, your backing of the team. I mean, w- w- what's, what's in it for you? Obviously, your son's a talented cyclist, um, mm-hmm. reached a, a World Tour team uh, for 2020, but initially you, you, you can't have known that that would necessarily be the path that he would be on. No, that's true. Um, I think, I mean, I've always been interested in cycling anyway. Um, You know, I was, uh, I never, I never raced. Well, I did race for a couple of years, but never raced properly and left me with a feeling that I wished I had. 
uh, for one thing, so I live vicariously now. Um, I suppose what really happened, though, was that um, when I met Flavio and got involved with the Zappi Club and then with the Zappi Racing Team, it coincided uh, with a time when I'd, I'd just finished. Uh, I'd sold a business, basically, and just finished working full-time with that, and I was looking for something new to get engaged with. And I uh, met Flavio, and uh, we became buddies. And uh, it's, it's not just about commercial sponsorship. It's about our friendship. It's about the fact that I, you know, I buy into helping young people, young riders to develop and all of that. Um, there's no commercial gain in it for me personally, but it's about doing something good and giving something back and putting my energies into something new and exciting. And I guess also as a parent, you know, there's a huge amount of trust involved when you're sending a, a, a son or daughter away to, to race, to go to training camps and into you know, what is a very demanding and, and sometimes dangerous world. Yeah, yeah, that's true, actually. Um, I, like most parents, I didn't really dwell on that, though, to be honest. Um, you know, I trusted Flavio, and I trusted uh, the guys that work with Flavio and the supporters that have been there along the way. Um, yeah, that's not really been an issue. I mean, there have been a few knocks and bruises and scrapes along the way, and uh, sometimes that amazes me that parents entrust us with their 16- to 18-year-old kids when we take them to Belgium and they race in the junior classics and they come back with broken collarbones and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's part and parcel of the sport, isn't it? And we do our best to mitigate that and, and work with the parents and keep them in the loop so they know what's going on. Is that something you're aware of as well? You know, parents are trusting their, their, their children to you, you know, when they're, they're on the cusp of adulthood, but they're still, they're still young people. Well, for me, it would be easier than uh, Paul because obviously Paul's team, 16, 17, uh, and un- under 18, so there's different, a little bit more um, responsibility. By the way, uh, in his team, we, g- we went through um, very interesting names, which I'm pretty sure you will be very proud to, to tell you in a minute. Um, for me, it was a bit more, um, uh, although they're over 18, they're still very young guys, and the, the family is a choice where they want to invest um, the boys um, uh, year off education to fulfill a dream um, there is a cost in there involving that and that's why I'm linking to the fact that I, we couldn't get sponsors um, almost ever um, therefore the family engaged financially um, to, do, to do this project they know what, I'm, what it is about it's about um, giving the boys the opportunity to, to, to fulfill the dreams but at the same time they have a a year out in, in Europe to learn language, culture, traveling, uh, seeing places, and live a, a, in, in, uh, as, a, as a group. So m- learning to cook, to wash up, to look after the bike, driving cars, uh, all those kind of things which are important as a development for a, for a human being. And um, again, like uh, Paul was saying before, it's not been always easy because uh, some people obviously they struggle. Um, homesick um, and so on but uh, we've got beautiful stories out of that. I mean so so basically it's a it's a gap year with a difference almost and, and, and a financial commitment from from parents on behalf of, of their children or, or if the if the, um, the the riders themselves have some have some money they can they can come in does it worry you that that, that cycling is a sport that um, almost self-selecting in the sense that if you can afford to do it, you can do it, and if you can't, your your talent might not be discovered. I guess. Yes, definitely. But um, on the same time, I got no choice. And there are when you go to to the supermarket, and when you go to the tolls, when you go to the petrol station, you need to fill up the car. And uh, if I got no sponsors, um, I set up a plan. I've, I've been very honest, very clear. It's written on the contract. It, it's going to cost this much money. If you want to be involved as a family contribution, you can do that. Um, at the beginning, I have to take wh- whoever believed it. And to be honest, you know, and a lot of people did not believe it at the, t- at the beginning. But the time showed that uh, you know, they were getting out a lot of it for the money. And, um, and they trusted me. You know, um, and that's how we operate now. Uh, 90% of our budget comes from the family. And I'm very grateful to, to the trust. Um, now I got at the beginning I had six riders. Now I got twenty. At the time I had uh, ten requests. Now I got sixty. And and the, 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 it's 
is just be honest that by, by showing that we're doing 40 UCI races a year and by showing that we, we, we're getting people going world tour or pro and um, but don't forget that at the end of the day it's always a very small amount of people that are making it but that's sport it's nothing to do with what we do or what boys are doing it's, it, that's sport but they always come back with a, an amazing experience so tell me some of the riders who've come through the various stages of the development team and, and, have, and have moved on. I mean, we, we know James Knox, of course, would be uh, now would be the, the most famous rider to have come through Zappies. Uh, as I said at the start, riding now for De Kerning Quick Quickstep, had an amazing Vuelta at Espana uh, in the second half of, of the season this year and, and looks to be on a, on a very good path. Um, but tell me about some of the other riders who've come through before we talk about James. Well, we had Dan Pearson. That was the first one the very first one um, uh, to be honest the very very first one probably Dexter Guardias uh, who decided to be in the domestic scene I think he had a, an amazing potential um, to be abroad but he didn't have the money to come with me uh, when we started the, the proper program so he decided to, to stay locally and but then and then what Dan Dan Pearson was the, the, the major breakthrough he uh, had a year or two at Aqua Blue didn't he yeah, correct. And then from then, um, three, three years Aqua Blue, and now he's racing for Canyon. Um, he, he still, I still think he's got an amazing op- possibility um, to race abroad, especially for his style of climbing. Um, and then we had several um, people that went to county level, you know, Owen James, for instance, um, now racing for Swift. Um, there's a whole array of riders which stopped with me and now they're racing a, a good level um, in England. Um, ben Hardy, um, I, I, I even forget now how many we got. <laughs> Bertie Newey went um, there. We had um, uh, Callum Ferguson, which is now my ma- uh, one of my managers, went yeah, over there. Will, the, Fox. Will Fox, yeah. Uh, but interestingly, uh, before that, with the, with, the, with the junior team, and this is what I, I, I want to... It, the, the upper, we set up the junior team to, to help having a better selection for the under-23 because it was difficult uh, with my program to attract the, the, the good talent that were there in the UK because obviously it was snatched by at the time uh, JLT or Wiggins or, or, or these people. And um, so we said, oh, we do an, an, a junior because then we can graduate and went over there. But uh, still, it worked a little bit. We, I managed to keep uh, some key riders for next season and, and, and this year, which is Mason Holliman. I'll tell you, I'll tell you in, a, in a minute. But unfortunately, we lost some big names, are we? Yeah, um, coming through the junior ranks, we had, uh, well, Mark Donovan's probably the most obvious notable, who's now riding with Sunweb, um, previously with Wiggins. He was a, a Zappy junior, did really, really well for us actually and got a lot of attention. Um, we would have loved it if he had continued through to the under-23 team as well. But, you know, Frank, we, we didn't have the resources to, to keep him. And I guess uh, Wiggins made him uh, a, a very attractive offer. Um, for one, Jack Savignages was another one who was a, a Zappy junior, went on to Wiggins and will be with Trinity next year. Um, and then ben, ben Healy as well was a Zappy junior who rode with us for two years, did a great job, um, got some really fantastic results actually, all the way through his junior career. Um, went to Wiggins and will be with Trinity next year. And, you know, I think he won a stage of Tour Lavenir this year, just gone. So he's got great promise as well. So there have been some, and that's just the name, two or three. There's, there's some other great riders that have come through our ranks. But I guess the, the, the whole thing for, um, for both of you is uh, that, if the end goal is to see young riders achieve their potential and make it as far as they possibly can if they're only with you for a year or two and and move on to somewhere else you still that's still the whole point of the team and 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 you can still go back to uh you know to parents and say well these riders spent a year or two with us and now look where they are i guess it all feeds back into um to what you've built yeah that's that's Mm. absolutely true i mean i think you know we feel a degree of pride and um, feel some kind of emotional ownership when riders build and develop and go on to, to build careers. But for us, it irks slightly if they go to Wiggins 
or to a, to another British um, Conti team, we want to keep them if we can and take them right the way through to World Tour, which we've done in the case of, of Charlie, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the, the competitive uh, nature coming through a bit there, Flavio. You want to keep hold of them as long as you can and then, and then plonk them straight into the, the highest level possible. Well, basically, it's, it's, it's not so much about being um, possessive. I think um, they are so young and so vulnerable for mistakes, which I went through. And I can see those. So when you move in, um, we've got a very nice junior setup, which is a perfect link into the young 23 to move forwards. To jump into a county team as from junior to let's say Wiggins uh, or JLT, uh, sorry or FDJ, which is is happening, it's got it's got danger, which is um, you can go through nicely. That's fine. In the case of McDonovan or who else, it, it could get worse. It could be you not ready mentally and spend another couple of years with me. I think it will give uh, the continuity that is 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 what is the purpose and let them grow physically let them grow mentally so when they're moving they're moving to race properly uh, ready for all different levels we show with Charlie that you don't have to be in a county team to make a, as a world tour we show that and um, do you think you're helped out by the fact that the trend is that the world tour teams are looking younger and younger for talent and, and almost bypassing the under 23 ranks altogether? We were talking to Rod Ellingworth, who's just gone to Bahrain McLaren, saying that you know there might not be need for the under 23 level for some riders. They might be actually better served um, going from you know from a, 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 a lower, more junior level straight into a world tour setup as as some are doing. Well, it's, it's, it looks like it's a, it's a trend now, isn't it? It, it did happen in back in my days. Um, myself, I was, a, I was a pro at 20, not even 20. And uh, we, we only did two years under 23. Um, and the, the, the Saroni was 20 when he went pro. And, and so on. I think it's very um, commercial. I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous. I think it's, it's, it's not for our sport. Um, it may be works for football uh, or maybe works still work for cycling I mean in, in the case of Remco but Remco is just one off eh? I think it's too dangerous and it's too risky for the for the boys not to have developed and therefore to be swapped with the next one and that's what I don't like I think we, we need to allow the boys to mature to get ready because some of those boys which it takes maybe a little, little bit longer they might be better though those guys they are already now and then the plateau where they are now and um, but that's that's my point of view, and is is a, is a point of view. A lot of um, all the coaches out there in Italy, I think, is a is a commercial trend. Did he want to jump in there? I think. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, it seem, it seems to me that um, with the quality of c- coaching and coaching is developing so much these days, and I I know for sure that y- at youth and junior level the quality of coaching is there, and kids are taking it so much more seriously at an early stage. There are, there are more young guys being delivered to closer to their potential at an earlier stage. I think, I think that's true for sure, and I can see that with the riders we work with, and I'm aware of the coaching that's going on around them. Um, but, but I think it's also true that kids can leave the junior ranks and then join, a let's say, a Conti team, for example, and then they can disappear into the ranks because the level of racing is, is higher and because the, they're racing as a team, they don't get the freedom that they might with an under-23 team to learn their craft as racers and to race against their own age group, which is part of the development for most guys, I still think. Yeah, there's a couple of things we've talked about on the podcast in recent months. One is that young riders of 16, 17, 18, they can see what a pro rider is doing on Strava. They can see what's required, what level those top riders are operating at. Okay, maybe not every interval that they're doing or every training session, but they can get a good idea of what the top riders do, which 20 years ago it wasn't possible. All you had to go on was what was in a cycling magazine or you know, you might get a, a, a little bit of information um, from an interview with someone. Um, you, you could sort of build up a training program that mimic the pros whereas now scientifically there's a lot more opportunity to mimic and develop and coaches know that as well and, and, and can tailor that for the younger bodies I guess the younger riders who are still um, developing physically um, and the other thing is that having a career as a pro rider isn't just about getting that first contract is it it's about getting the second one and then making sure you're in a position to get the third one I guess 
Yeah, I, I remember to send a message to Theo um, Kierke, um to congratulate him to move to um, at the time Team Sky said um, Theo now now forget what you've done so far just pretend you start all over again and uh, I said the same thing to James and James Knox I think it's, it's important they realise that I went through that I know exactly what what it takes is it, not just getting there it's stay there because those guys they're there now they're not going to lose their job they got family they have uh, their experience they're strong riders they are 30 35 they're not leaving their spot for you easy so if you want to take that spot you need to be really really strong and really committed really determined so talk to me about James Knox and how he first came onto your radar and, and what he did with Zappi well James was um was um got through the net of the British cycling to get like Dan Pearson at the time was um, the British cycling was more interesting in track um, talent boys and obviously those two they're not they are climbers so I, I took them board Dan through Dan um, Dan got me in touch with James James was a school for her first season throughout the f- June and um, and then from June onwards it was with me we, we I, I, I you you can see straight away when somebody's got that kind of mentality. It doesn't matter what bike, it doesn't matter what clothing, it doesn't matter what he's eating. He just wants to get on with the job and just do uh, the training, never complain, never, 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 I want to say never had any problem at all. Just just work hard and be very positive about it. Um, it and that's, that's per, for me, was a perfect fit because uh, for me, in my team at the time especially, it was about... Uh, the mentality rather than the gadgets rather than the power meter rather than the or the power shake or the, the uh, protein shake all that kind of thing for me it was important for them to set up the foundation of their um, mentality you know to go through any kind of issues without any worries any believing themselves and not have the need to have those kind of things to, to perform so it was a perfect match. He, he he went straight away, incredibly well. He, to be honest, his first race at the Valdosta, he, he struggled a bit. He crashed twice. He didn't finish it, but that was also a, a, a unlucky situation. But then by the end of the season, he was in the top twenty at Piccolo Lombardia as a first year. Now he's uh, he's pretty much <laughs> a good ticket. Huh? So did you know then that he had enough to make it into the world tour level? I think I think that's where I, I really realised there was something special there, really special. And the next season in Portugal, when he was fighting with um, Wood at the time, racing for rally in one of the uh, Portuguese races, I said, "This is this is something special, you know." And he he, he proved that we we squeezed him, I squeezed him a little bit that season because I was he was the top rider every single race. So. I, I wanted so much a result and he had to give us a result from January all the way to when I he I remember being in the car with Flavio for the uh, for uh, James's first race with you which was the UK National Champs in Abergavenny and we were in the car James punctured we got him back on the road and then I remember you saying to me you got to watch that boy he's going all the way I, did I? you did yeah do you remember that? Well, I I know he he was calling me, uh, Flavio. I'm so busy with uh, with uh, with school and I haven't got time for training. What shall I do? And I said, Well, listen, um, just go and run. You like your mountains. You like he's in Cumbria, so he said, Just go and run. You got you got only an hour. Just run on the mountains. And he, that's what he did, I think. <laughs> and he came to the national champion with no no training at all. And he. To be honest, if he wasn't for that puncher, he would have That's probably right. finished. He'd, he'd been <laughs> fell running while he was doing his A levels, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. But then he he kind of went on, didn't he? And then and but how did the move to the De Kernick Quick Step team come about after that? Well, to be honest, he did um, uh, half a year with me, um, and then another season with me, and then he went to Wiggins. And that's where he he, 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 he start pick up all the lovely fruit of a, of a, of the garden. Thank you, uh, Wiggins uh, team. Um, and but I, I'm, I was very happy because because I I was there in one of those results. It's sad uh, to think about it because uh, Bjorn is there now. Unfortunately, that boy he won the Yes Baston Liege, and James got second. That day. this is Bjorn Lambrecht, yeah. yeah. 
and um, I was there putting bicycles away in my van because my team didn't do much great but uh, I was in the car park and James Knock just got second for Wiggins and the first thing he did he came and looked for me and, uh, and he was so happy to tell me that and I was so <laughs> happy for him to do it it doesn't matter what jersey he had on because he's still my boy and he's still we're still very much in touch literally at the Vuelta literally every, every evening well, yeah, I was going to ask what your emotions were when the Vuelta was going on because he kept an audio diary for us uh, during the Vuelta. Every night he'd record a few minutes of his thoughts on the bus and we really uh, got an insight into the kind of emotional roller coaster of going into the Grand Tour after having had such a disappointing uh, previous Grand Tour experience at the Giro. Um, coming in a little bit uncertain, how would he go? Would, it, would, you know, would, he, would he be able to last over the three weeks? And then, of course... You know, he was right up in there. Then he got into the echelon on the Guadalajara stage. And, I mean, that sounds like one of the hardest days of racing of the year. And then, of course, the final mountain stage. You know, he was he was almost sort of prodded over the line by Philippe Gilbert, wasn't he? Um, when you were in touch with him, what were you, you know, what were you trying to say to him? And, and, and how did you feel sitting watching the race on TV? Well, I, I, I'm the first um, little crack on his... Um confidence was when he crashed the beginning before the Ashland that's what he said like, oh I'm just gonna just gonna let it go now I'm just gonna go for stages and uh, I said come on James come on come on five minutes you lost five minutes nothing in the Vuelta it's nothing just just sit in just make sure you're okay and then of course the the Ashland day went and he got 10 minutes so and then he went from there more and more excited about being in a in a in the in the GC because he's a GC rider, he's an, he's an amazing GC rider, and um, and it was just beautiful to 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 talk to him and uh, and share the emotion. Yeah. And does it help you that that riders are coming through that are now are? I mean, you talk about uh, Wiggins enjoying the fruit, but you're you're planting the seeds, I guess. Yes, but again, that's why when you're planting the seeds, like um, in the, for the same. Um, comparison you you want to make sure when the, the the tree is just about to grow you want to keep it safe because that is also wobbly isn't it and and that's where the danger is for me when they move into a, a setup which is very pro and they then then more interesting in other situation and the fragility of the mentality of the boy needs another year or two to to really get in the strength he needs and that's why, that's why um, before I was mentioning I, I, I'm possessive about it because I don't want all the time spent for him himself because he's the boy, he's, he's training hard, his family is he's spending time for him and he's, he's dream and maybe wasted it just for a little bit too impatience. So what will it be like next year when you've got James Knox to follow and also um, Charlie Quarterman to follow? You'll, you'll have a couple of names to keep an eye on as, uh, as the results come in and when the races are on TV. Not sure enough. <laughs> sure enough. No, it, for me, it's, uh, it's just perfect, isn't it? it? That's what I want. I want. I want more and more of those boys be there and um, and sharing those 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 lovely experiences. You know, whatever goes, is uh, we did it. You know, and then um, that's the, that's, the, that's the currency for success of success, isn't it, Flavio? When you can see your guys going through the ranks and ending up in world tour teams, that's what gives you the greatest pleasure. And success. Well, it's also to to tell the boys that the that's the possibility, and it's there for everyone, and it's to do with um, training, it's to do with lifestyle, it's to do with commitment, it's to do with passion, and um, and focusing on those those issues, and a lot of time because of social media, because commercial issues, the boys are deviated to things which are not necessary. And I'm talking about gadgets now. I'm talking about things which uh, deviate the the, the 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 focus. One old ex ex pro from Portugal. It was mending. It was it, it, seven, it was 75 at the time, and um, I went in there to see him because I like to go to ex pro and talk to them. And I said, well, "What do you think about nowadays?" I said, um, and he said in Portuguese at the time, uh, "Nowadays." Then putting the chimney before making the foundation of the house, and that's exactly what I try to explain to the boys. You need to do the foundation because the stronger they are, you can you can make as many chimneys you want afterwards, isn't it? 
Well, Flavio, that seems like the perfect place to leave our conversation for today. Uh, you're you're kind of the the site foreman. You're there um, manning the cement mixer um, to get the the ingredients to start building those foundations. And I guess that work will continue in 2020. Yeah, um, 2020 will be um, good. Uh, as I said earlier on, we got bigger team. Um, and um, um, lots of help from the families uh, but also this year um, like last year from um, from the boss of Plantex and with the brand Old Dwarf Bikes which is obviously is one of the only few people helping us providing all the kit that we need uh, to race abroad uh, that actually believes in what we're doing um, other than this man here and uh, some other little sponsor as well you know we got we got four or five sponsor which they've been there all the time small sponsor um Plantex is going to give us a lot of bicycle a lot of kit which is necessary for us for the future so yeah we um 2020s will be interesting 2020 20 riders five different nations new zealand australia denmark ireland norway and uk so um, we got about three or four uh, regularly racing for the national team so they they start believing in more and more in us i think we can closing down it help us of, um, of um, sourcing um, more riders to be honest um, my dream is to have 40 riders in the future and uh, because i got a calendar to provide a lot of races uh, um, for a lot of boys i just need to have more people with me to help me and a bigger setup and a couple of sponsors more and uh, I, I can probably give all those opportunities well Flavio and Paul thank you very much you're welcome yeah thanks very much good chatting ciao well not somebody I knew an awful lot about Lionel but very interesting to meet Flavio Zappi and hear his story yeah um, yeah very interesting actually and particularly his attitude towards developing uh, young riders and and the model that he's developed you know he's very transparent about how that model works and it's obviously been successful for um, for riders and I can't help but think that the likes of James Knox and now Charlie Courtman getting world tour contracts having come through Zappi's um, team is going to stand them in good stead but I, I imagine you know it's a constant battle to keep funding um, a, a program that takes the riders all around Europe throughout the year indeed and uh yeah, uh, uh, fascinating to hear his stories of the 84 Giro as well. Um, one that sort of stands out as one of the more famous editions of that race, I guess, with all the controversy around Francesco Moser's win. And uh, yeah, one of these races that certainly sticks in my mind. So really interesting to hear from him. Um, as we said at the start, uh, we have launched our friends program for 2020. Sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe it's a new system it works tremendously well jonathan rowe who's worked managing the french program for several years for us and does all our social media and stuff as well has done a fantastic job developing that and it, it's had well it's had a lot of good feedback from you so thanks very much everyone who has signed up as a friend of the podcast and please um do so to support what we do and support our plans for next year um and also our spin-off shows service courses out later this week uh, there'll be a new episode of the second podcast Femina in the new year there was one released last week as well and I think a new series of Explorer coming next year as well Lionel yes indeed um, well I can probably break this news now that Explore will return in January and will be a monthly show just like um, the other uh, well, just like Service Course and the Cycling Podcast Femina. So Explore will return in January. More on that in the new year looking forward to getting stuck into that certainly um, are we going to hear a clip Let's hear a clip from episode two for Friends of the Podcast for 2020. This is a, a mashup of our uh, live shows recently, and uh, that will be released later this week or the start of next week. Uh, so here's a little clip from it now. I'm quite impressed we've made it to stage five. No one's pulled out of the race just yet. All is in the sparkly leader's leggings. Um, but it's not who's wearing them on stage five, is it? It's who's got them on by the end of the, uh, the grand tour. Uh, um, Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> You're on, more than welcome to give it a go. How come stretchy Richard? are they? I mean, the grand tours were obviously fantastic, but that moment when Lizzie Dignan crossed the line in Wales and she'd won her first race, actually, since um, coming back and having a child. It was a wonderful moment. When she crossed the line, well, she wasn't in tears, but she was very emotional. She had tears in her eyes, and I was one of the first people 
um, to put a recorder underneath uh, her face and you know ask her how it all went and, and there was a crowd of people gathered round and she said um, I'm just really relieved I'm so emotional I've been trying not to think about Orla all week and everybody looked at me as if I'd done something to you I'm like that's the name of her daughter it's because she's a mum now I'm really puzzled because there's two typed questions I mean who's brought a typewriter here this evening <laughs> came back and the podcast was still going Daniel had managed still going to, it had gone from strength to well, strength well you managed to press record remember. on at least one of the days hadn't you <laughs> yeah. it was a bit of a, a bit of a dump as I remember it now Palm, you put some equipment some electrical equipment I'd never seen before on the back <laughs> seat and said good luck in Bo- and then your Italian became cl- fluent suddenly in bocca al lupo ciao <laughs> ci um, do you not pay attention when we're recording the not podcast really, to no. see how it no, works not no. really no well, you did manfully. You got through. You kept the podcast alive. <laughs> I love how you changed microphones and everything. I love it. Yeah, it changes everything, doesn't it? Allons, enfants, la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Contre nous de la tyrannie, l'étendard sanglant est levé. L'étendard sanglant est levé. Entendez-vous dans nos campagnes. What on earth is this? Well, <laughs> line up the brief for this week was bring some of your favourite kits. You didn't mention cycling. <laughs> and so that's Ivan Lendl's um, jersey uh, shirt for the 1987 Wimbledon, which, which is one of my favourite kits of all who, time. Who is the Ivan Lendl of cycling? It's got to be Rog, hasn't it? That was a little clip from our new friend special out very soon. Sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe. Um, your support helps all the stuff that we do and will help us next year cover the Grand Tours in the way that we normally do. So thank you very much in advance if you're just thinking about it. Well, we've got one regular episode still to come. Uh, that will be even more different than the trip to Nice last week, Richard, and uh, my interview with Flavio Zappi. A uh, real Christmas-flavoured episode coming um, early next week, just in time for Christmas, but will obviously be online between Christmas and New Year. Um, might even spark and inspire other people to uh, see whether they can they can do better than us. I'll leave it at that. I mean, if that I'm, doesn't whet appetites, I don't know what will. I'm really looking forward to our afternoon in the pub on Friday <laughs> with Ned Bolting, who's joining us for this experiment podcasting experiment finally before we go this week some thank yous to some of the first people who've signed up as friends of the podcast for 2020 thank you very much to ben dool to moyin islam to kevin sweeney to robert hill christopher leach matthew ray james pellet martin wasty james mon and gustav orstrom And finally, finally, if you'd like to give somebody the gift of a Friend of the Podcast subscription, that facility is now available. It's the perfect Christmas present for the cycling podcast listener who doesn't quite have everything or the perfect solution to a last-minute Christmas shopping crisis because it can be ordered very simply online and we'll take care of the rest. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com for details. But that's all for this week. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to The Cycling Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate us and leave a review on Facebook and iTunes. Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. This episode was edited and produced by Adam Bowie.